So bringing us to our final presenter, Will Bignall. I think he's all set up now. Will comes from a seventh generation um, farming family from Bothwell in Tasmania. So he's had a bit of a flight this morning over here. And um, the farming enterprise produces wool, poppies, lamb, venison, and a number of boutique specialty root vegetables. We all completed a Bachelor of Agricultural Science with honours at the University of Tasmania, and he's just recently been awarded his PhD, so he's Dr. Will Bignall, in molecular genetics, focusing on enhancing the long chain omega-3 in Australian lamb. So you're probably wondering, why is Will here with all this uh, talk on innovation and precision ag? Well, Will has another side um, to his life. He's interested in scenic um, gliding. He's got a scenic gliding business and, and he's always been interested in radio control aircraft. And as a result, he's blended his ag and, and aircraft knowledge and he's <coughs> set up a drone ag business which um, I think he's about to give us a little bit of a treat demo. But um, on that note, I'll um, ask Will to come forward and we'll hear his story. Thank you very much. Right, I got me on the mic. So you've got the biggest geek in front of you right now. So uh, it's his hard plastic seats and you've got your tailpipe on there for a while so I'll try and make it entertaining being the last speaker but uh, basically drones right everyone thinks hey they're cool they're all the business so um, look I, as I said you know I've grown up in a very random background so today I'm going to chat a bit about how random life is and uh, how you can end up at Marcus Oldham flying a little micro quad around a room FPV with a set of goggles on your head looking like a crazy ant so flick her over um, so this is not breaking any CASA laws because we're under a roof and all the other jazz. So what we've got here, this is like, this is what's revolutionised the drone game. So right now you're watching a live video feed out of this drone. In my goggles I can see the exact same thing. Um, and this has basically become consumerism at its peak. This thing's called a Tiny Whoop. Came about about five weeks ago. Um, of course I had to have one straight up. So. Small little drone, I call it a business tool sometimes if the wife's grumpy. But um, yeah, and then it's kind of stepped out from that into racing quads and um, all that sort of stuff. So you know, I'm heading off to the Australian Nationals next week with these goggles and a little drone that'll do about 120 k's an hour inside a very tight arena with a whole heap of other nerds. So <laughs> I hope they drink. <laughs> so, you know, it's basically a bit of just power up. So it's a tiny little machine, it's almost grunted out, but I can chuck these goggles on, you see, and just belt around the room. <coughs> so around we go, I had to get the fans turned off because I was worried about stacking it. <laughs> but you can see the kind of tech of what it's making you do. So I can pop it down low, run into people and they don't hurt. But this is kind of, geez, that roof looks bloody close, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but this is kind of like where tech's headed in the last, you know, this thing's about um, two months old, guy in America pieced together all these bits, and here we are, just being able to do something like that, and that's 150 bucks. All right, the goggles are 800, that's the deer bit. <laughs> <laughs> you show them the receipt for this, right? <laughs> you got to think. <laughs> so, you know, it's just tiny stuff, all consumerism gear, and the catalyst for it is in one of my pockets, causing me cancer or something, this damn thing, you know, the gyros that came out of that. And, um, you know, the Nintendo Wii came out and even parents started gaming. Um, the accelerometers in those, plus the iPhone advancements, basically made it all cheap. So my first drone came about from a Nintendo Wii nunchuck. Cracked her apart and built my own um, flight controller out of it. And now you can buy them for $12. So, yeah, I'm plugger. Flying around a crowded room. About a minute and a half. So you buy a shirt load of batteries. <laughs> yeah, look, battery tech is another, you know, I could go down another rabbit warren there. So, presentation time in a serious note. Um, so droning on. Prone to doing that, if anyone knows me. Um, so can anyone help me out with what this is? Yeah, so all good presentations start with an icebreaker, I was told. 
This thing's on, isn't it? <laughs> Tough crowd. Oh, well. So, anyway, I better get pretty serious, huh? Um, so, pretty much a bit of background. I've, I've alluded to it at the beginning there, why on earth I'm here. A bit about the drones, what on earth drone ag is, trying to do a sales pitch to a room full of potential customers, even though I shouldn't. Um, examples of what our work can do. And then, probably what's got you all interested the most is this BYOD, bring your own drone game. Uh, onto your own farms and what you can do and how it's being sold to us. So for me, I finished school, signed up to the Air Force, wanted to go through as a fighter pilot, kind of went through flight screening, hadn't told them I was a farmer's son and they, and being the eldest farmer's son, they raised us questions. So yeah, I was at this quandary, I was flying, got my pilot's license, I was heavily into aerobatics, um, you know, pushing that hard and they ended up choosing the lower path of uni. Because all I wanted to do was go crop dusting. Um, I love flying low and fast. Uh, unfortunately, now I do it with a pair of goggles on my head. But um, that's what I wanted to do. That was what my dreams were of. Still are a bit. Love to go fire bombing after a few, you know, few hundred hours flying and aerobatics and stuff. I still would love to get into it. But I did this Bachelor of Ag Science at UTAS. I weighed up uh, Marcus and Lincoln were the other two I was weighing up. And in the end, I decided I wanted to be close to family. So I did the um, Bachelor of Ag Science. So. The first bit of my background, at school I hated exams. I did creative writing, CAD, adventure ed, um, metal work, till year 12. And I did the most applied basic science I could. And I didn't do any chemistry, so I couldn't get into uni. So hence the expressions in these classes some days. But I had to do a bridging program, so I got in. So basically it was a case, as everyone said, application, application, big null. So I kind of came through it and I, Came out with a honours, first class honours, um, in I went in looking at wasabi, that was something I was dicking around with as his dad's way to keep us interested in the farm. And I came out kind of thinking, oh, you know, wow, I'm into genetics and fat. That had me interested of all the random things you could get into. So I kind of sat there going, right, I finished uni, I went home, you know, you, you row with the old man a bit and you do all that sort of stuff because you, you've got the world to change when you first want to come home. And you know, they, they finally just paid your bloody school fees off. And you're kind of sitting there going, what do you want to do? So PhD started weighing in my head. I, from my background, I thought it was impossible to do, but they were asking me to come back. I wanted to see my girlfriend a lot more, big draw card. Um, flexibility to farm and study. So we're only an hour commute from Hobart to the farm. Curious to see what I could actually do. Like that was probably one of the biggest curiosity factors. Um, Dr. Bignall made me chuckle, but I was curious to see what I could do and I was enjoying the research and some mentors that I was using, um, something I find important is having mentorship around you, you know, you can't soar like an eagle when you're surrounded with turkeys. So I tried to find a few eagles to hang on to, even if I was the mouse in their claws sometimes. But um, they talked me into it and I'm from a long line of renaissance men, so I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but anyone who can do anything. So my uncle makes whiskey right now, ice sculptures for Australia in Russia making uh, Winnie the Pooh inside a helicopter that's a whale with a machine gun. <laughs> that was his winning entry. So, yeah, my father's been incredibly innovative starting the deer industry in Australia. We made farmhouse cheese, milk sheep, do all sorts of stuff. So, yeah, tinkerers, that's the problem. So, probably the other reason I started was that was when I finished during SWAT back, um, getting away and going gathering sheep for lambing. Uh, it was all nice and green and we had a spring. Bodes will relate to this, but that was October 2006. You could see the turd, that's how good the spring break was. She's, uh, that's what the black dots are. So I thought, oh yeah, we've got a farm hand, we've got no sheep, we've got no food, I might go and take that paying scholarship. So I dodged down, what I did was this Omega-3 game. Basically long chain Omega-3 is what makes you healthy. Um, your body can't make it, it's an essential fatty acid. The only thing that makes it's algae, bulk of that's in the ocean, something eats that algae in the ocean and eats that and the bioaccumulates into tuna and higher order predators. However, we do make land-based omega-3, ALA, the short chain omega-3 that gets remarketed. We can convert that at 5%. So to get your recommended daily intake of short chain omega-3, it's 158 grams of freshly cracked walnuts every day. And I reckon the bloke doing walnut QA at Webster's doesn't even get up to that. So. You know, that's your 500 milligrams, which is about one low-grade fish oil capsule. So one thing that does eat a heap of short-chain omega-3 is sheep. They eat grass. Green grass is packed with it to varying levels. They eat it. We bioaccumulate it because it's an essential fatty acid. It happens to go into the short loin, one that we don't actually cook the guts out of. 
So what we were then doing was going, right, oh, well, it gets in there, the levels are highly varied. To measure it, you've got to kill it to get a chop out or a biopsy, which is very expensive. So I went to look at the molecular genetics of it, find the DNA sequence behind it and the triggering mechanisms and try and find some genes to exploit. Uh, good trip down a rabbit warren that was. And basically, domestication of sheep, they're quite homogenised, something they've never been bred for. The variation within, within and between breeds was as much. Basically, it's all down to feed, um, give them green grass, keep them young, get them to grow fast, and you will end up with a good dietary source of omega-3. So from this research, it stirred the pot a bit, and uh, now when you see lambs as a dietary source of omega-3, it's kind of, was there one of the groups that helped push that out to market? So that was kind of my PhD pathway. So the last five years, I started that one in 2007, so it took me a while to bowl it over. But uh, part of the problem was I quit for two and a half years. My brother was killed uh, five years ago. That, that'll throw a spanner in the works, I'll tell you that for free. Um, killed on the farm in a motorbike race, unfortunately. Um, so it kind of put a spin in what I was doing and uh, made me look pretty hard at what life was all about. When that sort of thing happens, you suddenly realise, well, it is just a piece of dirt and the people you share the journey with on the dirt is what counts. And that's how you ensure custodianship. So, you know, we've had 192 years on the place and kind of, you know, suddenly when you come down to the only breeding ram, you sort of think, geez, it's all, it all gets a bit exciting, doesn't it? <laughs> So that's where the three children came on the scene. I produced three young ram lambs. Um, my grandfather got down to two breeding stock, and so there we are now, back to three. Um, got the PhD done on part-time work. One of the problems was I got uh, landed with another job. I got a job offer before I finished, and I was gonna have a year off to actually use the PhD and cement in a salary package. And um, kind of got into that, looking at that, so I had to do a postdoc job. And this FPV video stuff, which I just demoed, was coming online, and that was pretty cool, and that got me kind of frothing on the idea of what we could do and how much fun you could have, because I was burning a hell of a lot of cash on Avgas. Um, and then I started flying the drones. I got an offer to fly for a company as a team pilot, um, a whole online community, but it was great, and now I've moved into sort of full-time farming. So sort of broad overview, background of what I'm about to talk about. So Seafish Tasmania was who I joined up with, um, it was a program that used my welding to year 12, I'm proud to say. I was uh, basically taking 80 to 150 tonnes of salmon guts, which is up here, this nice juicy stuff, fresh out of the plant, acidifying it at, 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 um, at the factory, acidifying it, going into a pump truck, coming up in 20 tonne trailers, uh, putting it into 40 tonne wine hoppers, and then we were enzymatically digesting it. So trying to cook it down to recover fish oil, water-soluble protein, and then soluble spadeable protein, which drops out the bottom, with the ultimate view of getting human-grade fish oil, feed-grade fish oil, and a protein solid as a feed ruminant. So when I started up, the boys were taking 48 hours to get the job going, and then my year-long program was to build this thing, so it's an oil separation plant, and I basically optimised enzyme digestion, worked out quality programs, um, worked with the guys on the floor, and we produced Australia's first ever fish oil capsule as part of my postdoc program. Um, that was quite fun, nice little pink salmon oil capsule. And uh, yeah, built this factory with a good team of blokes. So I can't show you his face because he owns a super trawler, but um, <laughs> quite an interesting journey. So I had a year with those guys and then they asked me to stay on. And, and the first job was, he said, oh, I've got a fishing boat coming. Can you help me do some paperwork? So I said, oh yeah, what is, can you show it to me? He showed me some pictures and said, oh, it's a big boat. It was the world's second largest fishing boat. So I said, like, okay, righto. So it actually took tonnes of CO2. When we did the CO2, the gas permit for the damn thing, the climate, the atmosphere gases, so they missed two zeros off the bill. And we said, oh, no. I said, no, you've missed two zeros. So she goes, oh, it's a big fishing boat. <laughs> so, yeah, parks just down here now at Geelong, doesn't it? The Geelong Star. So the company was basically, what we were doing here was taking a waste product, evaluating to it, taking processes, regional employment, all that sort of stuff, and fabricating gear. This was all second-hand gear, trying to make something of nothing. And um, it was all about quality of product in, product out. So to be crass, you know, shit in, shit out. Is it? it's, and something I'm gonna reiterate a little bit through the drone stuff. So while I was doing all that, um, still, that was my motor glider that I had. I used to do scenic flights over Hobart, make a bit of pocket money and pay the insurance. A few kids on the scene. He was as stunned as I was. <laughs> built a house and um, was still farming, so it's a pretty good juggler. 
So in 2013, I formed DroneAg. Um, the guy on the left is Kyle. He was a commercial pilot, uh, bush pilot, drop a plane in on anywhere, fly anything wherever you want. Um, and he got his act together. He owned a chicken shop, a franchise, and a water bottling plant, and made ice as well to sell to Asia to be world's cleanest water. And um, he was sick of it all and wanted to do drones because they're cool. So he got the rungs on the board and got Aerial Vision Australia up. And he's one of the first 80 to get the UAV license, uh, uh, UOC, the controls more than control stick, so basically your own mini airline. So I was going through the process and I thought, nah, I'll buy him a beer. So I bought him a beer and had a chat and I said, look Kyle, do you want to come into the ag world? And he basically said, yeah, I'm trying to crack into that. Uh, and so off we went. So basically we build, we do a lot of our own building, plus we buy off the shelf machines. This machine here was is one of the first, you know, three years ago we were flying this for 50 minutes, uh, mapping vineyards, doing NDVI. Um, a lot of elevation work, so it's a high endurance drone. Basically those motors were released, within five weeks we'd had a full set flying, uh, whereas most multi-rotors multi were flying for about eight minutes to 15 minutes if they were lucky. So we were getting 50 minutes. So you could go in and hit up a 35 hectare pivot circle in one set of batteries. Um, we also moved into planes, uh, electric twin engine. Uh, this thing flies for four and a half hours runs on a Tesla battery that we built ourselves. So it takes a day to charge a damn thing. So you've got three of those built. And the idea is you take it off on a road when no one's looking, um, get it airborne, and then you just chase it around. So it flies between the jobs, doing about 140 k's an hour between the sites, hits its target, does its mapping. But you can imagine at the end of a four hour mission and no photos were taken, or every photo's out of focus. So lots of things we had to work through with all of this stuff. And we do so much test flying, it's ridiculous. Our latest creation, which all the cool kids now have, it's called a VTOL, vertical takeoff and landing. So it's got four electric motors here on it. It's got a big wing and a petrol motor in the middle. The kids are all looking at it going, Jesus. Um, <laughs> it was screaming pretty hard. So it takes off on the motors in the middle of a bush. Like taking off and landing a drone is the riskiest part. You can smash your whole day really quickly. So the thing takes off on its own, we transition into forward flight, and it changes over to the petrol engine. Uh, you don't have to cart batteries around, you can usually buy fuel everywhere, it runs on premium unleaded, and it'll fly for an hour and a half. And then come back, come into a hover over you, and come down and land within a circle. We land in circles, you know, the wings are just about touching the trees. So we can get them down wherever we want them. Um, and that thing's, you know, that's what we need for ag ops. And so that thing will fly at night. Um, we do, we've developed some mineral sensing survey stuff, so some stuff's line of sight, but the bulk of it's on autopilot style systems. So some old stuff here just looks like a nerd's frothy box. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's just a bit of everything in there. It's changed a lot since then. But, um, you know, we're now at the point where we're flying a drone seven metres above the ground, contour following, chasing magnetic resonance. Uh, we can pick up a 250 gram unexploded bomb with the uh, magnetic sensors we've got. We can also map bedrock which is incredibly good for agriculture because every metre you come above the ground, you lose a cube of sensitivity. So if you're flying at seven metres, honking along the ground, and we're about one and a half k's away, I'll tell you now, it's really hard to pick up the dead tree. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good at climbing trees, <laughs> picking up pieces some days. So, you know, we've actually, this system actually gives a live FPV feed out of that, and we've got our own Wi-Fi network now between the drone and our base station with high definition video and we can watch the tree, manually grab a joystick, fly around the tree, back on mission and keep going. And um, you know, that sort of stuff's good and very handy and, and it's its application. So the drone is just a platform. It's all about this stuff, the data. So this is classic photogrammetry, been around a long time. Each of the blue squares represents a photo. The angles there show which axis it was taken on because the drone has a GPS and triggers it, writes all that data to the photo. There they are, all are along the bottom. Then you stitch it together, this is a pre-processing, so it looks awful. But uh, you can stitch together, that's a 130 hectare corner of a big pivot, kilometre long pivot. So it's you know, nearly, to, uh, nearly, um, nearly a third of it sitting in there. So we were mapping exclusion zones for a variable rate job, plus some of these soil type variations you can see for the variable rate package for poppies. So you can pull the data into this big 3D model, which is quite cool. What you're actually making is what they call a dense point cloud. So this is one here. These are millions and millions and millions of points where five photos overlap and it picks one pixel. They're all identical and it locks that down as a point in time and space within about five centimetres vertically and about three left and right when you get all the ducks to line up. 
So that's all dots joined together of overlapping data of a quarry stockpile. And then you stretch it, make some assumptions and make a colour photo. So this is a 3D terrain model of a gravel pile I made. Um, pushed out this quarry last year and just trying to work out how much road I can build out of it. So that's basically what you start doing with this kind of thing. You make these really precise digital elevation models. Um, so every three centimetres you've got a piece of data that's pretty accurate. The other thing's NDVI, which um, I've modified these slides a bit because it's touched on briefly before. Um, NDVI is a touchy subject, which we'll talk about a little bit more, but basically you're picking up chlorophyll and crop vigour. So that's a tin roof there of a house, comes up as dead. Green grass, things growing. This is a fallow paddock, but notice all around where the cars drive in and out, all the weeds have got going, there's a bit of compaction and weeds are growing. That, that's what it's showing you at a crude level. Um, this is kind of where it transitions. So to give you a whole idea of what drone workflow looks like, you start on the your left, yep, um, digital elevation model, you can do lots of things with. You do your raw um, near infrared imagery, convert, give it an NDVI values at five centimetre pixels, and then you step it up into a five by five metre grid or a 10 by 10 metre grid, and that creates your, starts to create your management zone. So it's all about taking something really precise and dulling it down and making assumptions. Um, that sort of data then becomes good for creating zonal management. We had huge waterlogging problems in here, and this, we finally got this alive. This used to be red three seasons ago. Um, and that's kind of where the data heads. Another example, uh, pivot circle going into virgin ground, old fence lines running through. It was actually blocking water. So this was a carrot crop that flooded. This is the next, next year's pivot circle for carrots. And this was the NDVI map of the carrot crop. And what happened is they got those big floods we copped there in January, everyone copped. And she came right through the crop and we wanted to work out what was left that was alive. And they went through just to target harvest in those sections, these bottom corner and this corner, and see what happened here. In the end, the whole bloody crop was sterile. But the guys just went there and within two hours surveyed this site. It's a 50 hectare circle. Just got everything they wanted out of here, here and here, put it into four bags, went and tested for viability, no, nah, game over. Didn't even bother harvesting it. So everyone saved money for about $1,000 to get the drone in and make a bit of data. Digital elevation models, yep, chuck contour lines in, do what you want with it. This one's interesting, shows the old dam cut by eye with a D4. She um, went a bit uphill here and obviously liked to run downhill, so didn't have as much wall. So, you know, you sort of see a more modern dam, which was done with a laser, bu with a GPS bucket on an excavator that matches the contour. You can start doing farm planning out of this, so pivots going up hills, vehicle rollover risks, um, slope erosion risks, all that sort of stuff, what you do with it. Digital elevation models again, this is this stockpile that I showed earlier. So with this online tool, any, any crappy computer can use it. Part of it's delivering your data to your client. Click, draw around the box of it, and there's your cut volume. So I've got 2,000 cubic metres still sitting there on my steps. And the dozer driver told me he pushed out 2,000, but I've already got rid of 1,500 out of there. So I actually had 3,500 cubic metres sitting against it, which knocks down your cost per metre off the blade quite a bit and actually helps you plan and say, right, we've got this much, I can actually do X amount of road budget for that. So all this sort of stuff, it's how you use it. That's what the key is. Drainage simulation, again, red areas are high flow. Probably look at this and just trip out. But um, what happens is the paddock's draining. This is a hill top here, a ridge. So it runs down one valley, runs all of these banks and out here, and this runs the other way. So red's high is wet areas. And I can vouch for you, you know, you get bogged when you try and drive through that a couple of weeks ago. It's really wet. These areas all get wet. And what you do from that then is start working up drainage plans, pivot wheel rut interactions, where you're gonna put drains. Another thing we do is air mass modeling, something we've just developed, uh, building frost towers for high altitude um, cherries in Tassie. The cherry game's on the go. So this is flying at 3 a.m. in the morning. Uh, it's minus five. And what we're doing is going around this is a huge orchard going in, massive investment, and they want to put in frost air towers to bring down the inversion and bust up the inversion layer. But where's the inversion layer? You either hire a helicopter, which mixes the guts out of the air, or you use a little helicopter with a very sensitive probe, um, and yeah, take off, do vertical columns all over the place, do cross sections, and then generate a 3D model of that air mass, work out where the inversion layer is, and try and find the ultimate points of where you pop your towers up for your mixes. And in one case, don't put it up because it's just cold air all the way up to 120 metres. So that's what we're sort of working on there. And that's again, just talking to a client and trying to find an application and 
find a solution for their problem, which is what we sort of pride ourselves on. So we are just a data gathering company. The drone's the cool platform that turns everyone's heads and they go, wow, that's a drone, that's wicked. Um, being a commercial pilot, a commercial drone operator, basically we fly when most people wouldn't fly. Our focus is on providing a product that clients can use and make decisions off. So that's what drone ag really is. And um, we're gonna talk about this a bit now in the bring your own drone sector. So basically we want people to make decisions and make money what we're doing. If you can't double your money getting us in, what, what's the point? You should be going and doing something else. So what are drones good for on farms right now? What are, what are people, who's, who's got them? Everyone's got a phantom, surely. We feel about, yeah, good chasing cars and everything else, aren't they? Getting about, well, look, right now, bring your own drone game, chasing, chasing stock, crops, infrastructure, sharing your story. Perfect for it, bloody brilliant. I gather sheep with it all the time. I just get her out and, you know, you can, you can push them. It's a, it's a game of animal behaviour though. Um, instinctively they want to go areas, you know where they want to go. All I do is just, the paddock's too wet or it's, I'm moving lambs around areas. I can just pop out and know exactly where it'll spook the mob. They'll mob up and they'll barrel out. You've got the gates open. I can move a whole mob within about five or six minutes with it. And they aren't, ter those of you flying around, they aren't really terrified of them. They, curiosity evolves. Um, and yeah, so I can use it and move sheep. I can go and check. I know where they camp sometimes on hills and you can run the drone over and quickly look. Uh, we've got a thermal camera as well. That's really cool for finding them. Find anything you want. Um, so it's, it's for fire ground mapping. But um, <laughs> yeah, you can find deer and all sorts of stuff. You know, <laughs> They all ask. Um, but yeah, and you can count stock. So that, that's, I reckon that's one of the best things. Checking on ewes. So I've sold probably about 30 odd to people in the last couple of weeks. Um, wanting to check use, just in being unobtrusive and flying at sort of 40 metres, looking down, taking pictures, reviewing it later, gets them all very excited. Um, probably the biggest problem is dogs. So you see that, you see that little black thing there, it's the propeller. <laughs> so you turn around, Jock hates them. This, this dog hates them. He, he's taken me down for the last three years. So, he, um, you know, you've got these other things to consider with it, of course, but... Um, yeah, he hates them. Turn around. I just came down, turn around. Next thing you know, you've got a collie in your face. Makes you jump. <laughs> so the other big thing is recording problems. Because let's face it, farming's not a collection of mistakes, but um, it's, a, it's a journey, isn't it, of remembering things that happen in a very long-term game. So that's my place at the moment. She's a bit wet. It's, um, I've got a big drainage system draining these flats down through here. Down my road, I've actually turned into a main drain feeds into the council roadway drains and then spills out here into the river, down through these yards as a last resort and then across my road and into my neighbour. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's what's going on right now in those huge wets. So I just chucked the drone up, sitting on the back seat, took the pictures, downloaded them, saved them, they're there. They're on my phone, something to look at. And this is your normal perspective farming. This is, a, this is going to be a pretty typical view this uh, spring in Tassie trying to sow poppies. So you can see there's a problem. They're going a bit yellow and we've got green spots and everything. You know, the hills look all right. The big water logging problem. So this photo I took three years ago, just with the old iPhone, capture it now trick. Saved it to a little folder and looked at it again. Now this paddock is, is I can't even get on it to spray it out yet, but um, it's due to go into poppies this year. So three years later. So. Some of my early drone pictures, it's looking at the same ground, you can quite clearly see where my drainage problem is. You know, I've got this low point, I've got an, an old fence line that still, still exists, blocking water a little bit, and I've got this low ground here that isn't overly happy. So, just this photo is worth its weight in gold. When, you know, three weeks ago we were a bit under the pump and we're trying to work out all this drainage and Basically, I've got digital elevation models of the paddock, but just this picture, I can make enough calls because this is this is this is easy stuff, really. This is you know any any mug with a grader blade can fix that. But then getting it out of there and not damaging your other paddocks—that's the trick. So we actually built a carrier drain here and a one-on-one one on, one, one on four hundred fall with a you now to manually do it with a laser and a really good excavator driver, which then feeds into that last road we saw and gets it off the paddock. And I've introduced three hundred mil of extra fall into the bottom corner of this paddock and this paddock's finally drained. I've got moisture probes in logging it all and it's finally started to drain since we cut it in compared to the other paddocks around it. So this sort of stuff, three years on, is brilliant. You know, that little problem, those weak spots, because I guarantee you can just tell me how last year's paddock went and all the good and bad spots. Year before, you only remember the good bits, because that's what you do, and 
three years ago, yeah, it was, it's in here, you know, you, you, you're guessing. So wiping it out. And the solution now, you know, I've just gone in, I've got a limited amount of time and budget, and I've whacked a great big French drain through one section. So dug a huge trench right where I wanted it. Pretty confident I'm going to get banged from a buck. No scratching my head, no running around doing the wrong thing. Got all the rocks I picked up, chucked them in the, ch in the drain, and again, put that into the neighbour's paddock. So <laughs> I did talk to him, I did talk to him. <laughs> but um, this is, you know, this, this is the sort of thing that, that's, this is what farming's all about, isn't it? It's all about making those little hits and getting a big bang. So this whole section here, just water logs, the pivot ruts, and it's awful in the spray rig. I hope she'll be right this year. So, you know. Is farming really ready for drones? It's a million dollar question I get asked a lot, particularly by investors. Um, yep, it's ready for that new perspective and data recording and sharing your story along the way. Like when I upload this stuff into our Instagram feed and stuff, it goes off, it goes all around the world and they love it. I've got videos, you know, I've sold some videos to various places and they've got seven million views and that sort of stuff. So, you know, we create viral content with it quite easily. Um, NDVI, it's the remote sensing stuff. It isn't ready yet. The new sensor came out. Um, so Phil was uh, the first speaker talked about it quickly. He said he just got his as well and flew it last week. A new Parrot Sequoia, the first real NDVI sensor I've seen that's not 60 grand, that's actually true hyperspectral or multispectral. Um, that's the most exciting thing to happen this summer. But right now, really be careful of what you're going to think about putting your money into. Interpreting the data and implementing it, that's the tricky bit. That's where your bang for your buck comes from. And data storage and sharing and cloud processing, something to be very wary of. There's a lot of snake oil sellers out there and a lot of companies data mining you and charging you a good price for it, and double dipping on it, um, because that data is king. You know, there's a lot that can be done with it. So nothing wrong with paying for data, you know, nothing wrong with playing with data and generating your own. I'd be very wary of buying an NDVI camera, like a hacked out camera for your Phantom or something, or a hacked out modified point and shoot. Um, really, you can see it with your own eyes. And as my business partner who was into bottled water and chickens, and a commercial pilot, he looked at the first set we did three years ago and he said, I don't see a difference. And it's because it's not true hyperspectral. It's not picking up what we can't see. So the resources better spent getting bang for your buck elsewhere. That's one of the big things you want to weigh up with drones. You know, you might spend 5,000 bucks getting a digital elevation model, but is your gear up to actioning it? Do you have variable rate spreading? And how much variation have you actually got? Is it quantified? Um, you're going to put drainage in, you're going to get on top of that. Uh, or should you just spend eight grand on fences and just get your utilisation up under your pivot or, or in your grazing ground or change something else in your system? Because ultimately I believe drones help the top 10%. You know, the top tier farmers get that real bang for their buck out of drones and also the guys right in the weeds at ground level wanting to make huge changes, they get big bang for their buck or doing a big conversion. We did 780 hectares for a guy, he invested 12 grand to get the data. He's got his whole farm and digital elevation model and going into irrigation and he is getting massive dividends right now because he's, each pivot circle he's doing, he's got all the drainage in before he starts and he's up and running, hitting the ground running. So it's kind of where I think to be. Um, thanks for your time. Thought I'd rub it into the Victorians, a few poppies. Um, <laughs> so you know, more super varieties coming in. But um, yeah, so cheers. So I've, dra I've dragged on a little bit too long, but um, I think I was worth it. <laughs> Thank you, Will. That was brilliant. It certainly summed up um, that how adaptive agriculture is to some of these new advances in, in the di digital world and, and precision ag. So, um, look, I am mindful that we are um, a little bit over time. Um, I could take a couple of questions now, but really limit it just to two. Otherwise, um, Will will be more than happy, I'm sure to catch up with any of you during the lunch break. Um, so if anyone's got a question, I'll happy to take a couple. No? Oh, yeah. How long do you reckon until they're using drones for like automated spraying, like uh, if they, they can incorporate that or into actual practices? Yeah, look, so that one, I think that's a solution looking for a problem. Um, you know, okay, I've got like I've got a really crappy sprayer, an old Gold Acres original. It cost me twelve and a half grand. I get two and a half thousand litres in it, eighteen metre boom, and all the GPS systems on it. And you can make that go and spot spray a paddock better. Stick to tram lines. As far as then going out and doing targeted weed spraying, 
to get GPS really accurate over one point and hit something on the ground is really hard. It's, it, it's harder than you think. And like I live in the geospatial world way more than I thought I ever would. Um, you know, for the same amount of money, you could spend 25 grand and buy one of those flash ute based rigs with a thousand litre tank and electric reel and, and do all your spot spraying that way. But to actually go and target and send the guys to the right spot, that's where the value is. Like we've done um, bone seed and a couple of other nasty weeds. Like I've just timed it when the, when the weeds, they've had a heat wave, everything's died off. And I've just gone through with NDVI, grabbed them all and then created a heat map. And the guys just got a GPS and all these waypoints in the area. And that's been really good. Like the guys were frothing over that. They were just hyped. Same as rat bait stations. We mapped a whole island where they lost these rat bait stations. And someone just sat there and trawled through the photos and just marked them all out. But yeah, as far as spraying, you know, there's, there's too much other good gear about. You can buy a little spray rig for four grand and do some damage. <laughs> Another question? Oh, okay, Des. What do you reckon, sir? Couple of case studies. What's been the biggest thing for about, you know, that you've seen? Drainage. Drainage, yeah. Like, particularly with that good old opium. Like, I mean, we were my first paddock. Like, we had about seven hectares. It was very iffy, and we got that back into production, and it, it came in at five thousand hectare gross. So seven times five is a good number, and it would have been about a five thousand, six thousand dollar investment in the drone and, and analysis. So that's where it works, um, and this planning applications and um, some. Uh, yeah, you know, saving companies time and looking at crops and doing a forward estimation for whole companies of their whole crop, you know, saying you've got X amount, good, bad and the ugly. And that can help them predict bringing money in and forward markets and all that sort of stuff. They get big bang for their bucks. But um, yeah, the, the data's just got to be so good and I reckon our Precision Ag guest as well will very much vouch for that. Okay. Well, I might um, leave it there, but 